friends, welcome to Worship at First United Methodist Church. The church is on the move for Christ here in Winchester and Frederick County, Virginia. My name is Sean Devilice, the pastor here at First. I'm excited for us to share in this time of online worship together. A couple things you know. First, pre-recorded. So you're going to see us in some different places, uh, even different outfits throughout the service. We're starting to blend in our worship that takes place on Sunday mornings into our online worship, which is awesome. And there's going to be some stuff we get to iron out with that. But today, you're going to get to hear about baptismal reaffirmation. And I think that's really cool that we get to remember what our baptisms were like. And if you haven't been baptized before, or if you can't remember it, there's still something in the story for you as well. So as we do that, know that you can like, comment, or share, whether you're worshiping us on Facebook or YouTube. Let us know where you're worshiping from. Uh, it's a great way to see how the Spirit brings us all together. But with that, again, I'm excited for our time together today. Let's worship. Friends, now a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him. And he saw God's spirit descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, today we get to finish a series that we've been doing called To Be Determined. And for all the significance and meaning of Jesus' birth for people of faith, the world just kind of kept on spinning like before. So what does it mean to practice our faith when our future is still to be determined? Over the last few weeks, we reflected on how our faith and trust in God is done through song, as we shared in Lessons and Carols. Then we heard of the hope that we find in the story of Epiphany. Today, we get to reflect on baptism and what is significant about the promise that we make in baptism. We also ask ourselves how we can envision living out those baptismal vows this year. Let's pray. God, I give you thanks. I give you thanks for this day and thanks for every opportunity we have to be connected with you. And to remember the fact that you love us and see us as people of sacred worth. Bless us now that we might learn more about you, more about ourselves and more about each other. And I might grow closer to you and one another as well. We love you. Amen. When you woke up this morning, what was the first thing that you wanted? Maybe it was more sleep. Maybe it was a cup of coffee. Maybe it was less noise around you. Maybe it was to get ready for something exciting today. Or maybe it was to finally start feeling better. Right? Maybe it was to finally see things different than the way they have been. Our lives are filled with wants. And I think a lot of times we contrast those wants with, say, our needs. You know, things that we need to survive, like that cup of coffee. Just kidding. Kind of. You know, contrasting those against the things that we desire but could live without. Say like a new shirt or something. I don't know. But I do want to invite us today to look at our wants a little differently. To understand that our capacity to desire is something that God created us with. And along with that capacity to desire, we are also given this ability to make choices about what we want. We can trust that those things come from God as we see God wanting and choosing things in Scripture and wanting and choosing things in a way that works for our good and the good of the world. We've heard a lot about what God wants and what God chooses to do and how those things go towards our good simply in the last few weeks. We think of Christmas and how God chose to come into our world in the first place, and that was through Jesus. And then we think of Epiphany and how God wanted to be in the world with Jesus starting as a vulnerable baby in an unexpected place. And now we fast forward a couple decades and we see how the baptism of Jesus goes. And it starts pretty simply with Jesus' desire, his want to be baptized. I mean, think about that for a minute. This is Jesus, right? Jesus the Christ. And suddenly he probably could just decide to be baptized at some point. But no, Jesus still desires this moment, specifically with John the Baptist. Now, I mean, that's his cousin, but still, it's kind of an odd thing to, to, to want a specific way to go. 
And that that's striking. That's so striking that this is the story that is mentioned in every single gospel, all four of them. And the conversation around it is different, but what a great testament to the reality of this event. That different people saw it and they have different words to describe it, but we know it happened. The conversation between John and Jesus, cousins again, is only here in Matthew, though. And John is all like, Jesus, I kind of need you to baptize me. Why are you asking me to baptize you? And we hear Jesus' response in like church fancy language. Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. There's a few things about that. Yes, in Jesus being baptized in this way, it's fulfilling prophecy that we find in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. But we should also note that the, the gospel of Matthew is all about righteousness, right conduct, doing things the way they should be done. So long with simply fulfilling prophecy, we're also taught that baptism is important. And even more so, we're taught that wanting the relationship with God in the first place is important. There's this affirmation, this appreciation, this sacred aspect to simply wanting to be with God. And this powerful moment when Jesus comes up from the water, he sees the heavens open up and the spirit of God descends like a dove. And we hear this voice, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. What a cool moment to think about, right? That the first thing God does in response to this baptism is to say, I want Jesus, I want this relationship. I desire this relationship back. Now, we could read this as an intimate moment with God and Jesus, Father and Son, and say that it specifically pertains to them. But that's not how we read the rest of Scripture. We trust that this is an opportunity to get to know a little bit about who God is and how God acts, just like every other thing we read in Scripture. And so it's an opportunity for us to learn that this is how God looks at you and me, too. I know I don't recall seeing a dove the day that I was baptized. I'm born and raised United Methodist, so I was baptized as a baby. Uh, I don't remember it happening to any other baptism I've been a part of. But what was present, I trust when I was little, and, and I believe it now, and is as powerful, is that same love of God. The love found in the family, the love found in the church family, the love found of God. See, when we ask ourselves to remember our baptism, it's not simply trying to recall what it was like to be spritzed or splashed or submerged in water or to wear some form of baptism outfit when it happened. To remember our baptism is to remember that God loves us even before we know we need God. It's called prevenient grace. That's why we baptize babies in the United Methodist Church. It's a remembrance of the grace that comes before we know we need it. God chooses us. God wants to share that love with us from the beginning. And that God who loves us wants this relationship to go on. So we have justifying grace and sanctifying grace that we can get closer to God. And we don't always stay perfectly close, but we understand that that relationship is always ongoing. That truth is not just life changing. That truth is life giving. When we think about water, water is symbolic of new birth, of being cleaned, of having a new life in Christ. But it's also something that makes up, like what, 70% of our bodies on a good day. And we experience in the world every single day as something that sustains life within us. And with all of that, it means that God sustains us even though I make mistakes, right? Even though I fall short, I'm not worth less to this God who loves me. In a world where we tend to value what we do over who we are, that's huge. So I try to tell the parents of children that I baptize, especially my own, right? That the effectiveness of their baptism isn't determined by me. And I don't mean like if they ever act up at some point that that's not my fault. Again, I baptize my two kids. And so believe me, that's not what I mean. What I do mean is how I turn out doesn't affect their relationship with God. Not at least in the baptism sense, right? Like I have a role and responsibility to model what it's like to have a healthy relationship with God, of course. But what happens to me doesn't negate their baptism in some way because God doesn't mess up. That's also why we don't re-baptize people. If you remember your baptism, then that's important. That this baptism is about wanting people to know about this God that wants them and loves them and that we as the church want to love them too. When I did 
baptize our, my daughter and my son. The other part of it too is this is the beginning of a relationship that I expect and believe and pray will continue even when I'm not in the picture anymore. That's the kind of faith that comes into this, right? This belief, this hope that this God will be with us always, whatever may come. And so it's in that promise this morning that we remember our baptisms. And again, if you haven't been baptized or you can't remember it, remember this idea that God loves you and know that it connects to you too. Because baptism is, is something we do as a sacrament. It's an outward sign of an inward grace. It doesn't make the love possible. It recognizes that that love happens and is possible and does exist. And remember too, our desire to know God. To want a life that is connected to this God that loves us and to be in relationship with God's people. So that being baptized is a practice that reminds us how we are set apart, ordained, if you will, as God's people for doing God's work. Professor Brett Younger from the School of Theology at Mercer University in Atlanta puts it this way. Baptism is our ordination to ministry. Our vow to live with more concern for the hurting than for our own comfort. And our promise to take issue with ideas with which everyone else agrees. Baptism is the commitment to share our time with the poor and listen to the lonely. I would add to that, in remembering our baptism, we remember our responsibility to love one another. To resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they show up. And that's something we pray each week here at first. And so we finish now where we started. Asking ourselves, what is something that we want today? As we hear that question, and we think about what it means to remember this baptism, I want you to think about how many times you're going to encounter water today. When you wash, when you cook, when you drink, when you look outside the window, and if you're in Virginia, there's a good chance you've seen water in just about every form that it can take outside, right? Snow, sleet, rain, whatever. All of those are reminders of just how God is present in so many ways. And so what I want to challenge us, I think about how it means to live out these vows for the whole year, maybe for, for longer, or even just for a day. Each time we experience water, I want you to invite God into that moment. To say, God, I, I love you back. God, I want to do what I'm called to do in this moment. Think about what that would mean for your interactions with your family or your friends or at work or at school or with yourself or whatever, to welcome God into that space, to remember what it means to be loved in those moments and what it means to love creation back with God in those moments too. That kind of good news is going to give life to people in ways we don't even understand, right? There could be multiple people in the room and they're all going to have a different takeaway of it, but what won't change is that that love is real. So this week, May water remind us that for all of the things that we want in this world, there is this God that loves us forever and will never leave us wanting. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you sustain us, for all the ways that you keep your promises to us. And one of the ways that we do remember our relationship with you is to join together in prayer. And so we lift up the leaders of our community, state, nation, and world. We pray that you soften hearts, that we can remember our shared worth as your people. We pray for all those affected by illness. Pray for first responders, for those serving in roles, providing care for others, for those who teach and who learn, will they have a degree to show for it or not? We pray that we have the courage to be hospitable towards others to be an anti-racist people until racism is gone from this world. We pray for those affected by disaster, natural and man-made. Lift up all those serving away from home, those without homes, and those who could not be with us today. And we commit ourselves, just as we think about in baptism, to resisting in mind, body, and spirit any form of evil, injustice, and oppression that present themselves. And God, we pray for peace. We lift up Andy, Brian, Dorothy, Gary, John, 
Joy, Judy, Maureen, Marlene, the family of Ron Schickel, and others on our church prayer list. And pause now of the others on our hearts and minds as well, silently before you now. God's for all these people, each and every one of these persons that we give thanks to you and ask that you continue to remind us, to, to empower us, to equip us in all the ways that, that we don't understand. But God, also move us in such a way that we might be willing to share your love in ways we do understand. We love you. Amen. Friends, at this point in our service, we get to worship together with our offering. There's a couple different ways you can share your offering with us here at First UMC. I'm going to go over them real quick. There's an offering box in the back. Uh, that's a way to give financially. There's also, I think, some giving envelopes left. Great. There's some giving envelopes left to pick up if you'd like to mail your offering into the church. Or you can give online. That's a safe and secure option through a website. Every time you give to the church, it helps sustain the day-to-day -day work that we do together. It helps make worship possible and mission possible. It helps make sure we have people that can be in meetings in the community advocating for our neighbors. Uh, you should know that over the last couple weeks in December, I got to talk to you about where we were with projected expenses for the year and our projected income. At the start of December, we were looking like we were going to be off by $31,000, give or take what came in in December. After what came in December and what actually was able to be spent, we ended up short like $2,900 for the year. I want you to hear that again, right? We went from this 31,000 hole that we were facing and brought it down to being off $2,900 from what came in to what went out. That is a tremendous reflection of your faithfulness. And what a gift that is to know that we can keep meeting these needs that we have said is ours to do in this community. So as you give today, you give towards that general budget that, that leads to us to have an expense of about $4,300 a week to do that ministry together. Thank you for helping us to meet that need. Along with that today, uh, there's a chance to do a special offering, and, and we keep track of special offerings along with the United Methodist Church as part of our connection. This one happens to be Human Relations Day. If you want to give towards Human Relations Day, you should know what it is. It is a day we celebrate and support through the special offering social justice and outreach ministries that empower all of God's children to realize their full potential as human beings in relationship with one another. How cool to do that the same day we remember our baptism, right? Through the Community Developers Program, United Methodist Voluntary Services, and the Youth Offender Rehabilitation Program, this Sunday offers aid to a multiracial and ethnic collection of church and community-based projects that strive to bring about justice, reconciliation, and human development. Again, a lot of words. We're going to keep doing that today. We're going to have a lot of words, but here's what that means. You have a chance to support that special offering that is empowered by groups like ours, connected with so many other churches across our community and our country and our world to help do that work, along with the work we do in our community here. So that's a lot about financial offering, how you can give to the church, how you can give to that special offering. If you want to do that, just note special offering on your check or put it in an envelope that says that. There's some of those in the back. That's not it, though. Because the ways that you give of your time, each and every time you volunteer in this community, whether it's through this church or something else, every time that you help a neighbor out, that is an offering that you give. And every time that you pray is an offering as well. To know that today, through our financial gifts, through the offerings we have of our time during the week, and through every time we pray, we get to celebrate those offerings together as we join now in a musical offering, which is number one.
you please pray with me? God of all wisdom, how often have we been deaf to your voice speaking to our hearts, especially when we move in a world that needs it so desperately? There's a reading from 1 Samuel that brings us the phrase, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, which resonates with the relevance of the evening news. As we bring our gifts to be dedicated this morning, we pray that you might open our ears and open our hearts to hear where you call us to respond with obedience so that we might do what you need to begin healing our world. In Christ we pray. Amen. As we have a chance to remember our baptism today, we also have a chance to share in a prayer that comes out of our Wesleyan tradition. John Wesley being the guy that helped launch the Methodist movement that eventually became the United Methodist Church. And so as you open your hymnals to number 607, I'll make sure I give you time to do that. Uh, we'll have a chance to share in this prayer together. And also, as we remember our baptism today, I also, there are handouts on the back table as you leave that you can take a copy of this prayer with you, something that we'll share in communally here and something that might touch you enough that you want to share in it throughout the week. So, will you pray with me? I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou will, rank me with whom thou will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low by thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am Thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Friends, today as we do so many acts, these outward signs of God's inward grace and in our relationship that we have with God and one another, we give thanks for all the many ways that we are, in fact, connected. And so as we prepare to move into a time of Holy Communion now, I invite us to silently confess before God all those things that we feel are keeping us from doing this work that God has called us to do, or keeping us from understanding our own sacred worth or the sacred worth of others. Let us confess those things together now. Friends, hear the good news. As you remember our baptisms, as you remember the works of Jesus Christ, we know that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. And so you and I can rest assured that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And on the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, Christ took the cup, again gave thanks to God, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So it is in those mighty acts in Jesus Christ that we come together in prayer now. And God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Through your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at the heavenly banquets. All these things are a joy for us to remember that we are connected to, a story that you are continuing to write, and one that moves us to join together now in the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Of the joy and sharing and communion by intinction this morning, you will receive a piece of the bread, be able to dip it in the juice, and then as you go, uh, there's our baptismal font over here. I know that for some of us, it's going to be add some extra steps on the way back. Uh, we're also going to move that to the back space before we leave today as a chance to touch and remember our baptism. This baptismal promise that God makes to us that allows us to share in this work of coming together. Something I share every time I do communion, uh, because it's not really me doing it, is that this is not my table. It's not the table of First United Methodist Church. It's the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All are welcome who wish to come forward. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for you give us all these ways to remember who you are for the days that we have a hard time remembering who you are. Bless us this morning whether it's for a moment or a day or a week or longer, with the knowledge that you are present in our midst, that you love us as we are, that you see us as people of sacred worth, the days that we can hear your call and the days that we struggle to listen. We trust that you are at work with us. May we rise from this table, empowered by this outward sign of your inward grace, to go and live into our baptismal vows this day and every day. We love you. Amen. Friends, this concludes our worship service today. And I have a couple announcements to share with us as we get ready to go from this space. First, again, on the table in the back is a copy of that covenant prayer. Uh, so if you'd like to take that with you to reflect on or to add to your prayer life this week, feel free to do that. Along with that, uh, this Thursday is our next day to help with CCAP, Congress Community Action Project on, on Kent Street. Uh, we'll be there from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon if you would like to be a part of sharing in that. Uh, we also have a, several other announcements, things coming up in the coming weeks and months. So please, if you have not already found a way to either get emailed or find online or get regular mailed or whatever other options there are for receiving communication, please let us know so we can keep you in the loop of all those things. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to invite Miranda to come forward to share an announcement. Okay, um, Stacy, Shelley, and I are part of the Pastor Paris Relations Committee, um, along with Ben Brockensmill, who is celebrating his mother's birthday this weekend. <laughs> As you know, our congregation collected a love, love offering before Christmas. Oh. At this time, we would like to give our thanks to our wonderful pastor, staff. Carolyn will be also awesome. receiving something. So as a congregation, we would like to thank them for everything they have done for us this past year. Amen. <laughs> thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I'll say thanks Did on behalf. Did you like to say something? <laughs> so where will we be the They're the, They are the basis of our gathering. All I can say is you are a rock star. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, yes. Thank, thank you, you guys. Uh, and please likewise know that you all are a gift to us. So thank you for this love offering, but uh, please know that it is a joy to serve here. I think I speak on behalf of Melody and Peter as well for that. Uh, and to see all the wonderful ways that we can share in doing God's work and sharing God's love together. So with that, I invite us to stand as we're comfortable for the benediction. Friends, now we get to go. Go into this world and notice all the ways that God is around us and whatever form God is choosing to take at this particular time. Go encouraged and assured that you are loved and of sacred worth and a gift to God in this community. In the name of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, remember your baptism and go in peace. Amen.